And now to introduce the panelists, there we go, introduce the panelists and the topic, here's Rob Grossinger, Vice President of the National Community Foreclosure Response Initiative with Enterprise Community Partners. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Ken, and welcome everyone uh, for joining today to talk about um, access to credit, the myths and the realities that many of you are facing out there in the community, as you, especially the NSP1 grantees who have finished up a lot of their acquisition and rehab work and are now looking at trying to market those properties and wondering what happened to all the home buyers. Um, what is the current status of credit? What are processes that you can undertake to have better relationships with your lending partners uh, is all wrapped up in this, this session today. I want to introduce our three panelists. Um, Tom O'Neill from Bank of America, LaDonna Reed from Chase Bank, and Mike Dawson from Freddie Mac. Each will bring a different perspective to the discussion, but let me just say that all of them are battle-tested in answering questions. Um, all of them, especially Tom and LaDonna, have been through the recent clinics that many of you may have attended around the country, and there are no questions you can't ask. There's no issues they're not willing to address within the, the purview of their expertise, and please um, remember that the goal of this is to really get down and drill down into what's going on for these two major lenders and the secondary market, Freddie Mac, with respect to the current state of the credit market for mortgage lending. I will say the one area that none of them can address, and especially Mike, is the future of the GSEs, so uh, you can ask the questions. I'll simply respond saying we have no idea. Uh, so let's just leave that uh, off for another. If we ever do understand the future of the GSEs, Mike will be the first that wants to know, and then we'll try and do something that can explain that to uh, all of the NSP grantees that are part of our network. So with that said, um, let me get into setting the tone just a little bit, and then we'll turn it over to our experts. And what I'm hoping for is the ball from Kent, so I can actually forward the, let's see. Uh, you've got the ball there. I've got an ineffective ball. Okay, let me try that. Does that help? Yes, it does. So, uh, again, we're going to uh, examine some trends in the mortgage origination system, look at some myths that we keep hearing out there in the market and try and address those with the realities. And most importantly for all of you on this webinar, a, a large, a long question and answer session to let you really um, vet the issues you're seeing in your markets and see if um, LaDonna and Tom and Mike can be helpful in shedding some light on what you're seeing out there. So I have a couple of slides I want to uh, touch on for you, which are fairly, you will, none of these are going to rock your boat in the sense that you know all of this. But it's nice sometimes to just see it all together. And this is still a very good time to be a home buyer. Um, mortgage rates are at, still remain at very, very low rates. Uh, there is a huge, as you can see in the next slide, surplus of properties out on the market, which is also a, it's a double-edged sword for you as NSP uh, developers because it's a great time for home buyers, but that means you're also competing as you're trying to sell houses with other either distressed sales, such as short sales or foreclosure sales, um, outside of your NSP work, or just the normal home sale market. So, again, this makes this clearly indicates it's a, it's a great time for home buyers to get in the market, but it does indicate it, it, it has that double-edged sword. Um, we are continuing to see home price declines in different parts of the U.S. As some of you may have read recently, the projections um, for continued decline in certain markets range from 2% to 20%, um, depending on the market. That, again, is a double-edged sword. For home buyers, that means prices will continue to be low, if not lower, which allows more affordability. But for NSP sellers, it means there's a hesitancy on the part of buyers because they think if they wait longer, housing prices may continue to go down. So, um, with any trend in the housing market, there's always two sides to that story. Um, obviously, uh, rates for lending, affordability are at both lows and highs, so mortgage rates are at all-time lows. 
the affordability index is at an all-time high, which again gives you some sense of what's going on in the market. This, I think, this last slide that I'm going to talk about is absolutely enlightening about the current state of mortgage lending. In 2006, at what had been sort of the height of mortgage lending, 55% of the loans that were sold off into the secondary market were sold off to private label owners, private label investors. Those were what all of you know as the mortgage-backed securities and collateral debt obligations that were not held by either the GSEs or Ginnie Mae, but were being held by um, Wall Street in some form or another, whether it was Goldman Sachs or Bear Stearns or even any of the big um, financial institutions that held in their trading desks private label mortgage-backed securities. So 55% of the secondary market was held by the private sector. Now, the private sector is 2%. And Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are 70% of the secondary market. Ginnie Mae is 28%. It is a, and, and for those of you that are tracking Humda data, FHA is one of the largest, if not the largest lender right now in terms of mortgage lending. So you've seen a complete shift in who is handling this volume. And I think for us, as those interested in selling homes and revitalizing communities and getting home buyers to come into revitalizing communities, it does give us an opportunity to talk to the secondary market, which is interested in policy as well as profit, and I, I mean policy in a broad, broad sense. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to, to have those discussions. And I think for all of us in the world of NSP, um, and not just the NSP program, but neighbor, neighborhood revitalization as a whole, it does present some opportunities. But that's a very dramatic shift in the market. So um, what do we hear out in the market? We hear nobody will lend in declining markets. We hear that FHA is the only option and that there's no private lending going on. We hear that the PMI companies are not active at all with first-time home buyers that um, lenders, such as you'll hear from Kent and, uh, I'm sorry, from LaDonna and, and from Tom, will not originate mortgages if you, as an NSP grantee, create a soft second program with your funds, and finally, um, that everything is just too complicated when there's federal money involved. I think all of those myths can be debunked today to some extent. I think your questions will help us do that as well, but it's also embedded within LaDonna and Tom's presentation. So, again, I urge you to be as vocal as you can, either with your typing in your questions or calling in, because this webinar is only uh, as effective as it is in terms of bringing you the information you need and answering your questions. And so I, I encourage you all to be active in that regard. So with that said, I think it's time to turn over to Tom O'Neill, Senior Vice President with Affordable Housing Programs for Bank of America. And Tom? Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm going to go through a brief deck here, but let me just, just uh, talk about it in broad terms. And what I, I hope to provide you today is a, is a discussion of some of the issues that we as a lender or any lender uh, has uh, where we're dealing with uh, subsidy liens, subordinate liens that are, are you know, by definition, a community second program, uh, a standing rate terminology or an affordable type and study terminology. And, and, and where we've run into some issues. And, and a lot of those issues really relate to how your lien is structured, whether it, whether it fits the guidelines of uh, the GSEs or HUD. Um, we run into some issues with communication with the lender. And if you're using uh, your subsidy as, as say, a, a, um, uh, a reduced purchase price, where it's not hard money for down payment or closing costs, but rather you're subsidizing the purchase price of the property, and then simply some of the nuances of, of lending where we have involved, and that's where, where we've also run into some issues. So moving to my first slide, I, I'm going to talk just about uh, an overview of secondary financing. Um, I'll try to keep it as specific as I can for its neighborhood stabilization, but really it, it, it crosses over into almost any form of, of soft second uh, through a housing agency or nonprofit. If an NSP program is structured for lenders to originate a first mortgage uh, with a concurrent close of the agency second, we have specific responsibilities that, that we need to, to follow. And, and within the bank here, of course, we're, we're, we're looking to 
to uh, ensure that our first mortgages are, are eligible for sale in the secondary market, so we need to follow closely Fannie, Freddie, and FHA guidance. For consistency in terminology, you will going to use the term term community seconds, but, but in deference to, to our borrowers from, from Freddie, if, if Freddie, they, they refer to them as affordable seconds. Either way, we're, we're referring to, to the soft seconds from, from again, housing agencies and nonprofits. Nationwide, Bank of America has approved over 1,800 of these programs for use in conjunction with one of our first mortgages. 170 of these have been done in conjunction with NSP money. So, so we're very active with with um, a review of the programs that, that are out there today. Now, I, again, there are some, some issues, and that's the purpose of, of this discussion, but, but absolutely, you know, we want to be involved with, with you on your your, um, your, your NFT funding and, and how you structure your programs. Many of these programs, however, just uh, or don't meet secondary market guidelines, and that's, that's something that, that I'll, I'll try to touch on as we go through this. On the conventional side, we, and just to give some basics, the, the combined loan to value can be up to 105% or to a level that covers all of the eligible costs on that they pay loan. The subsidy provider generally places their own restrictions on borrower eligibility. The lender, first mortgage lender, is not concerned with those restrictions. We you know you're bound to certain eligibility requirements of the NSP program itself, but if there are other restrictions placed, that, that's, that's up to the agency and, and, and second lending provider. Uh, common restrictions are income limits, purchase price limits, first time buyer, which, which isn't applicable here. But in almost all cases, there are resale restrictions. The um, community second programs or affordable seconds can be structured in many different ways from our perspective. They can have zero interest or very low interest rate. Uh, they can have shared appreciation in lieu of interest. The payment can be deferred for the first several years or no payment at all for the entire term of the loan, where the loan becomes due upon uh, sale of the property or change in occupancy. Or they could be forgiven over time, either partially or fully. Agency guidelines on the conventional side, uh, I won't go through all of these, but some of the, the key uh, requirements of uh, Fannie, Freddie, and HUD are outlined here when you create your, your second lien and, and, and the terms of the second lien. And recently I had a, I was, was involved in a, in a discussion with one uh, NSP recipient about the structure of their program, and, and the, the comment they made was that it, it, it's not their requirement or not their their um, responsibility to ensure that that they structure their program. The reason we were meeting is, is it was because Bank of America couldn't work with their program, and 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 it's simply because they didn't structure it in a way that that a lender like us or most lenders. Uh, could work with their program. So I would strongly encourage that um, both you and or your your, your legal counsel that, that develops your, your lien documents uh, become uh, well aware of what the, the agency guidelines are for, for a, a soft second or, or subordinate loan. FHA guidelines are outlined here as well. Uh, there's is, is a little bit more uh, pointed. Uh, they require that the, the lien be um, in the name of the, the subsidy provider, so if, if whoever the recipient is, the lien documents for the second lien have to be in that name. Uh, you cannot put the lien in the name of a nonprofit if you are working with a nonprofit that's administering the program, unless that nonprofit is an instrumentality of government. So, in other words, it's, it's created or, or overseen by the, the housing agency. If the subordinate lien has resale restrictions, that are imposed on the borrower, and virtually all of the NSPs that I've come across that do have any restrictions, deed restrictions, those restrictions under FHA requirements must terminate in the event of a foreclosure or deed in lieu, and that language has to be very specific. We come across uh, quite a few programs where, where that is not the case, and that makes it ineligible for a first mortgage uh, that's insured by FHA. And then VA is the most lenient. They basically require that the, the lender simply confirm that the veteran benefits from the program. And, and although they, they don't have specific uh, approval requirements, um, uh, if the program is, is uh, provided through a government entity, 
uh, you just need to we just need to warrant that the that the benefit um, have the better and benefits of the program. Just as a as an overview, whether it's Bank of America or any other lender, uh, we're going to want to review that that subsidy uh, for for assurance against the guidelines that I mentioned uh, previously under Danny Teddy or, or HUD. To do that, we would like to get a, a program description with the with the outline of what the eligibility requirements are, the the income, purchase price limits, and you know, any any maximum assistance, uh, the financial terms of the subsidy, and so forth. Contact information for who we need to reach out to should we have questions or to coordinate a closing, uh, and then copies of the legal documents, the note, and deed of trust, and mortgage. Some NSP recipients. Um, in creating their program, require the lender to execute a participation agreement with them. Uh, at Bank of America, we're not opposed to that, so I have come across circumstances where some of the the, the uh, reps and warrants we're being asked to make are, are simply not workable for us. So I would also take care with that and, and make sure you're again communicating with your with your lenders. Some of the uh, common um, questions that come up and what are some of the causes for, for a community second or NSP to, to, to be declined. Uh, again, sometimes it's basically that it's, it's just boiled down to the structure of the program, whether it, it meets the agency guidelines. So, for example, there could be shared appreciation, but it might exceed what, what HUD or, or Fannie or Freddie would allow. Uh, as, as I just mentioned, a participation agreement may have some provisions that, that the first mortgage lender can't whether they would want to or not, simply can't let them warrant to. Uh, so there could be some aspect of the processing or funding of the concurrent loans that's incompatible with, with our systems. At this point, and then the last bullet point on, on rehab, uh, that's, that's where we run into an awful lot of our problems with NSP. Uh, we've seen some, some programs structured where the, where the NSP recipient wants to be very much involved in the, the disbursement of the funds uh, for, for rehab once the property is, is, is acquired. So it'll be, be purchased in its, in its current condition and then rehab, which forces the first mortgage lender into a, a rehab first mortgage, such as an FHA 203K. Um, that, that can pose obstacles. Uh, some lenders don't offer a 203K program. For those that do, we have seen where there, there was uh, just a lack of understanding of what we could can work with uh, when, when it comes to the control of the escrow. Um, Bank of America's position on this, at least as our understanding of HUD guidelines, is that the, 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 the escrow has to be uh, administered by the first mortgage lender. So uh, we caution you when it comes to, to oversight of the, the repair work that's needed uh, to make sure that, that you're, you're communicating with your first mortgage lender and it's understood how that needs to be done. Can the agency fund the rehab and complete the disbursement? It just depends on the extent of the rehab and when it will be completed. And obviously, if you're getting into the health and safety issues, uh, that's going to have to be completed prior to the close of our first mortgage. Or again, the lender, first mortgage lender must use a rehab product, such as 203K. And again, as I mentioned, we must administer the, the rehab disbursement. Can the agency put the funds into an account and allow it, allow the lender to manage on the rehab? That will be very lender specific. Uh, there are some systems complications that make that difficult for, for some lenders. Some lenders that, that fund a, say a two or three K loan, uh, can only seek, uh, funds from the NSP recipient and deposit it into their escrow as they service that rehab account. So once again, if, if, if there are any questions about that disbursement process, if, if there's rehab work to be done post-closing, uh, please communicate with, with the lender you're working with. If the agency does not own the property, they can fund and manage a completion of non-health and safety issues such as carpet, pay, landscape, and so forth uh, with the first and the work can be done after closing. So if it's really minor work, not impacting health and safety, uh, and yet you want to include some of this with, with the uh, property and, and, and use of your funds, uh, that will work. Um, again, just in the health and safety being a requirement to be completed prior to close, 
uh, it's likely the contractor will need to agree to be paid um, uh, until close of escrow and the agency will need to record the second mortgage concurrently with the first at closing. The amount of the second may include funds dispersed to contractors as well as down payment and closing costs. Some of the solutions that we've seen that seem to work best, you know, first of all, when you're, you're getting into a situation where you have rehab or you want to incorporate your, your subsidy to include rehab, allow the first mortgage lender, if they have a rehab product, to, to build it into their loan. That's, that's really the, 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 the easiest way for the first mortgage lender to, to do so. Use the NSP money as, as opposed to using it for rehab. Use it simply as, as, as a, a, a a buy down to to um, the, the down payment requirement. So so fund the larger down payment up front, uh, disperse it toward that, lower the first mortgage amount, and then let the lender uh, set aside the funds that are required for rehab. Of course, you can always fund down payment and closing cost assistance, and and, and that's the cleanest way that that, that we've uh, participated so far with with many of the NSP recipients. Uh, and that's it. Thanks. I don't know, uh, Rob, if you want to hold questions for till the end. Yeah, I think I think we will. Thanks very much, Tom. I, I would like to, to stress for everyone a couple things. We just eliminated four of the five myths on your sheet listening to Tom's presentation. Clearly, uh, Bank of America, and I know you'll hear from LaDonna in a minute, the Chase, and uh, for those of you that were at the clinics, you heard this also from Wells, they are lending. They are approving programs in uh, NSP communities, which may be, many of them are thought of as declining markets. They clearly are not FHA, so that means that FHA is not the only option available. Thanks, Ken. Uh, the only option available for permanent fixed rate mortgages. Uh, clearly, they are originating mortgages with public soft seconds, and it may be complicated and it may be not, but it's being done. So it's not too complicated. I think I want to stress for everyone on the call that uh, Chase, Wells, Bank of America, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac all participated in the five clinics that HUD held, all at their own expense, all gave up a couple days of their time to come to those clinics for all of you, to help all of you better understand how to access mortgage lending, how to access them for help for mortgage lending. So if they're that committed to be able to spend their time with all of us, I really want to stress for all of you to call them as you begin to use soft second programs or any kind of down payment program, whether it's an existing program that you are already running using home or CDBG or some other pot of money or a new NSP program, the folks that you're hearing from, Tom uh, and his boss, Dottie Shepik at Bank of America, and LaDonna and her boss, Denise Smith at Chase, and the people that were participating from Wells Fargo, are really there to help. Call them. Work through these issues ahead of time so that you're not coming into something where all of a sudden you realize there's an out-of-compliance piece to your program and nobody can lend, not because they don't want to, but because there's no uh, there's no secondary market for them to to sell the mortgage to. So they are, their numbers are all on this uh, webinar. Their numbers were all handed out at the clinic. They really do want to hear from you, and it's much better for them and it's much better for you to address these issues up front or even during your process than at closing or near closing when you realize you have a problem. So thanks again, Tom. I'd like to turn it back over to uh, LaDonna Reed uh, with Multicultural Affordable Lending at Chase Bank. And LaDonna has participated in the clinics, and now we get to have her here on this webinar. Thanks, Rob. Good afternoon, everyone. And I really appreciate you guys taking the time um, to log in. I really think this is some very critical, informative information that we're giving today. So before I even start my part of the presentation, the first thing I want to say is ditto to everything my colleague Tom from Bank of America just spent his time talking about. It's very critical that everybody understand that a lot of us, specifically your Bank of America, Chase, Wells, we're all in the same boat when it's trying to make sure that as we structure financing for our borrowers and our customers and your constituents, that these things are presented and structured 
so that they can be layered on to loans. I think you're going to find, guys, that when it comes to things like this, we are all playing very well in the sandbox together. So, again, ditto to everything Tom said around how we're looking for that language, what are certain things that become challenges and stumbling blocks. So please do, as Rob reiterated, reach out to all of us if you're just developing an NFP second or anything like that. We are more than willing to get our experts from any of the lenders that you want um, to work with to sit down and actually look at how you're structuring, look at the language, let you know what are challenges for us and what are things that we can do. So that being said, once we do get past those those challenges around how the seconds are structured, what is the language in them, can we layer them onto various products, we've still got to address other challenges in the market. And so I just wanted to talk to you briefly about what some of those things were because they're challenges for you as you work with your constituents and they're also challenges for us as we try to work with your borrowers. So first of all, uh, there's generally three challenges that we're going to face. Credit, because we know in the tightening we know we've got FHA, but we know with some tightening in the market, a lot of people got to come with more more money down, larger down payment, more has got to come from their own funds, and then also property condition. So as we look at those things, what is the first challenge? Credit score challenges. Most banks, Chase included, often put um, overlays on their credit score thresholds. So for Chase, for instance, it's 620. So how do we address working with our nonprofits and our other partners around getting those credit scores up to levels that are acceptable from a mortgage financing standpoint. One, we work very closely with all of you guys who are consumer credit counseling agencies who provide budget and credit counseling to their constituents so that they can understand what those thresholds are and really help their constituents address how they need to get to a level that is financeable or ready to be financeable. So I know you guys do budget training and things like that. I know that my partner, Bank of America, we as well as well all support NeighborWorks Training Institute where you can send your counselors so that they understand how to do things to help support this issue, classes such as maximizing credit. So we do things like that to kind of support you guys to help you work with people to improve credit scores. The next biggest challenge we make is down payment and asset challenges. Now that we know with the current markets and with some other things, MI companies don't go as high as they used to from a loan-to-value standpoint in terms of issuing MI certs. And when they do, even with community seconds and secondary financing from NSPs and things like that and other grants, we often do need higher credit scores. So, again, we talked about how we address the higher credit score issue. But the other things we do is we look for funding such as EEH program for Employer Workforce Housing Initiative. We work with our bond and HSAs across the country that offer down payment assistance programs. We work with nonprofits who are managing these secondary, second, sorry, community mortgage products that help us help borrowers bridge that gap. So again, it's great because because you guys are working with NSP funds, the counseling is required. It's going to be really critical that we work together as partners to make sure that, A, people are aware of the resources that are out there and available for them through working with the counseling agencies and that we work internally to make sure that our staff is trained and able and ready so that when a borrower walks in and they want to work with a Chase or a Bank of America or a Wells, that originator has the ability to say to that borrower, you know what? It looks like you qualify for X. We can make that referral to our nonprofit partner. Um, property condition challenges. One, we know not all banks offer rehabilitation products, but when we do, we know that that can be a stressful transaction for a lot of first-time home buyers. So where you guys really have a niche is that most NSP programs are being used to actually rehab those properties and get them ready for resale. So then that kind of takes that stress off the borrower and gives a borrower a property that we know has been really done well. A consumer can be able to walk into that and be assured that it's been done in a quality way so that when that person gets in their home, there should be no surprises, no financial stress around something breaking down or going wrong. But we do look for opportunity to work with nonprofits who do quality rehabilitation before they sell those homes, who help and handhold their constituents during that process. 
And then finally, we try all of the banks to offer affordable products. Obviously, FHA and VA are great. Why? One, they already require a lower down payment. Two, they give us some flexibility around the types of down payments that are available from gifts and other assets, specifically community seconds and other types of grants and programs. Chase has DreamMaker, but Wells and Bank of America and some of our other um, partners also have their own in-house uh, products that they make available for first-time home buyer or lower moderate income buyers. We work with Fannie and Freddie. We do the My Community and Home Possible. And then we also work with our state bond programs, which, again, offer a plethora of these other products overlaid with the down payment assistance that they offer through their bond programs with a very affordable rate. So we look to try to get as many programs we, as we can to make available, to make financing available to those specific markets. And then Tom went through the things. These are the things that we would need to actually get a down payment assistance program approved. Tom went through it, so I'm not going to read it to you guys. But if you do, again, if you're not sure what you need, just please reach out to your partner at Bank of America, at Chase, at Wealth, and just talk to us about what those documents are that we require, who we need to get them to so that those grants can be approved for use at that financial, excuse me, that financial institution. And then, again, GPA program challenges. Tom talked about that. He actually went into even more detail. But, again, we do. We look for language that usually does something around inclusionary zoning or resale restrictions, and those are the things that tend to be the, the issues that we try to work with and resolve with you. So if you're on the call, um, you can always reach out to me. My information, cell phone, and email are out there in the deck that uh, Rob and those guys are providing. I've also, as well, listed out my peers who exist across the country. So if you want to reach out to one of them because they're serving your market directly, do feel free to reach out to them as well. Thanks, Lizana. Uh, thank you very much. Before I turn it over to Mike, I wanted to just um, stress one thing that Ladonna said and, and for all of you. Uh, I've heard from a number of NSP grantees that uh, when they – finished some of their homes and went to their home buyer list that was given to them by their home buyer counseling partners and there might be 50 people on the waiting list for them to talk to, one of them qualified or two of them qualified. One of the things that uh, the financial institutions on the call today and others are always willing to do, and that's part of what LaDonna's shop and Tom's shop do, is to create partnerships with home buying counseling groups out there so that they are better equipped, those counseling organizations, to adjust to the new credit environment so that they understand better how to pre-qualify people um, in a way that's consistent with the current credit market. I mean, there's no question, and I think one of the initial questions that was asked quite a while ago is, well, has Crestage came out? So what is the new environment? How do the home buying counselor partners that you so desperately need to work with to provide you with potential home buyers, how are they in sync with the lenders? Lenders will help you do that. They reach out all the time to home buyer counseling groups. They provide um, straight up training to them. In many cases, they're supported uh, with grant funds by the lenders. So please think about if you're, if you're finding a very large non-qualification rate from the home buyer counseling groups that you're working with, encourage them, if you have to lead them by the hand, to partner up with some of those uh, larger financial institutions who can do the type of training to get them to where their pre-qualification process is consistent with today's credit environment. Um, so uh, I'd like to now turn it over to Mike Dawson, um, who's from Freddie Mac. He's the Vice President of Single Family Affordable Lending and Deal and Contract Management. He wins the, the prize for having the longest title of anyone on the webinar. Mike? Thanks, Rob. I'll be looking forward to collect that prize pretty soon. But um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity this afternoon or this morning, depending where you are, uh, to, to give you an overview uh, what we have going on at Freddie Mac. And as you all recall, that uh, Freddie Mac does not lend directly. Uh, we work with Chase and B of A and others to establish uh, what we hope to be consistent programs and provide liquidity and stability in the mortgage markets. And um, so, again, we, we provide a number of resources uh, on our website and through uh, the 
with various colleagues that we have across affordable lending and other areas in the company to make sure, again, we, we provide the information and tools necessary um, uh, to allow us to provide kind of our mandated mission here at Freddie Mac. So, um, as you can see, just a quick overview of some of our activities in the markets over the last couple of years. So, since 2009, we have funded over $850 billion of mortgage loans in the nation, serving about 4 million borrowers. And roughly 45% of those purchases over the last couple of years uh, have been to low and moderate income borrowers. So again, our programs, uh, while broad and in a lot of cases specific to in the affordable lending com community, have been and have touched kind of all segments of the United States housing market. And as we saw, uh, kind of in the first, or uh, the myth number one that Rob has spoken to, do we lend in declining markets? We have been lending in all markets. And uh, by the numbers you see here, I think that's proof positive that has been the case. While certainly the credit guidelines have changed over time, and appropriately so, um, we are still very active in this space. And what has uh, been kind of dominant in the market over this time, too, is that uh, the refinance activity has allowed about 3 million families to refinance their existing mortgages, saving roughly $6 billion in interest payments. Um, included in that number, too, whether it be both purchase or refinance, or primarily in the purchase markets, we finance about 270,000, slightly shy of that, first-time home buyers. And we'll talk, too, about some of the products in a little more detail here in a minute. Um, but we do provide avenues and opportunities in that space. And in 2010 alone, we funded approximately 390,000 um, uh, low-income borrower mortgages. And we define those at, at kind of at or below the 80% of the medium area income. And again, this is a nationwide type of figure. And the one thing we also support, and again, this is uh, an activity uh, jointly with Fannie Mae, we are supporting the U.S. Treasury's Housing Finance Initiative. This initiative was created um, back in the, actually at the end of 2009, and uh, U.S. Treasury set aside uh, roughly $11.7 billion uh, for single-family uh, borrowers uh, through the housing finance agencies, again, both state and local, to allow them to originate uh, mortgages and for Freddie and Mac and Fannie Mae to purchase those mortgages um, to, with a primary goal of unlocking and stabilizing the housing finance agency uh, origination uh, processes. As you call, recall back in 2008, 2007, 2008, that market essentially locked up. Uh, the primary activity of housing finance agencies and providing funding to borrowers was through the through, was through the bond markets, and the mechanisms that they were using at their time at that time um, um, they ran into a bit of a liquidity issue. And by providing not only the cash to originate new mortgages, we provided liquidity and credit support to existing bonds in the market. So, again, both Freddie and Fannie jointly administer this program. Approximately $3.2 billion of, that, of those monies uh, have, been, have been used through 2010. So there's about $8 billion remaining to be allocated, actually to be used in that origination process. And the way the um, uh, rate, rate um, setting process has been worked out with the U.S. Treasury, the housing finance agencies are going to have somewhat of a competitive 2011. We are in the process of uh, providing an update to this uh, um, uh, program. Uh, we should have something available mid-March to late March here. Uh, that will reaffirm, basically, and, um, re and, and show where we've done with the program to date and what needs to be done to, to work through the remaining allocations as it were through the end of the year. So the point being here is that there is a fairly ample supply of cash that's already been set aside for the housing finance agencies and available for first-time home buyers and available for, obviously, permanent financing um, for the communities out there. 
So moving to kind of the Freddie Mac affordable offerings, and at the high level, you know, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, as many of you know, is the hallmark and cornerstone of the U.S. market. And uh, over the years, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage um, is, is actually the, the trading of 30-year fixed rate for mortgages in the form of a securitized product, in this case uh, the Freddie Mac Gold PC, is probably, if not the second most liquid security or securities in the form of MDS in the market. And uh, uh, our approach of providing broad-based, consistent uh, products in the market allow for a slightly better interest rates in this product because there is an exit through the securitization market that's traded globally. And, uh, and this is a key theme I want to keep putting out there is that um, we look to consistency in our origination or actually purchase practices to ensure that the liquidity and the pricing characteristics of the mortgages themselves that go into the securities um, remain, um, remain again, um, as, as the most, uh, well, I'm searching for a word here, is providing the, the, the most liquid type of execution available. And so we guard the 30-year mortgage, guard the securitization market, markets uh, very closely to ensure there's always the, the best execution possible there. Um, the specific programs around affordable offerings, we have the affordable, the home possible uh, product, which I'll, I'll, I'll delve into here shortly, along with affordable seconds. And, so, and down payment assistance programs and guidance around those um, that would fit into uh, some of our purchase programs. And again, all of this material, whether it be marketing material, specific product information, is available on TradeMac.com in the single family tab um, on the uh, homepage there. As I mentioned on the next slide here, the home possible offering um, is a responsible low down payment mortgage option for first time home buyers and low and moderate income borrowers. Yeah, it tends to, to, to fit the borrower profile again of the first time borrower, uh, families in underserved areas, new immigrants, and very low and low to moderate income borrowers. Now, recognizing, of course, that I guess what you would say, FHA is the best execution at this time given some of the down payment features that they have relative to some of our offerings. But again, our, our desire here is just to make sure everybody is aware of other permanent financing options in the programs and availability of those programs and the literature around those programs that uh, we make available. The key features, um, I think many of you have seen this before. Again, there's fixed rate products. There is uh, ARM-based products, both 5.1 and 7.1 type products within there. There are manufactured homes eligible, eligibility within there, of course, but with certain limitations uh, within there, and there's maximum uh, TLTV and LTV requirements in there. So as always, the, the benefits to the borrower is that, uh, particularly with a fixed rate product, you know what the monthly payment is. That is not going to change in a fixed rate mortgage product um, that's offered within here. Flexible closing costs and funding options within there. And uh, uh, there, are, of course, are some limitations, one of those being the no cash out refinancing. And again, on the home possible, we do have a lot more detail on the website that uh, provides other benefits and potential restrictions uh, within there. So I would encourage you to take a look at those also. On our affordable seconds program, well, we won't buy the second. We do provide guidance on uh, what we would allow in purchasing the underlying mortgage here. And, you know, again, the, the borrower profile uh, would, would interest kind of those who would uh, kind of use a, a program like this who would need some, a uh, borrower who would need some type of flexibility on the secondary financing within, you know, potentially the loan moderate income borrower. Um, it is available through our automated underwriting system. There is allowance for multiple affordable seconds, but of course, with uh, some limitations or limitations around total LTV and LTV characteristics within there. And again, it, it, it sets the framework that 
uh, will allow some flexibility on, on secondary or, or, or second style financing um, to provide uh, down payment assistance and other assistance within that category. I'm going to last uh, item here is that the combination of down payment and closing cost assist assistance, uh, we do provide sources of information on our website that uh, gives you some idea of other options out there that uh, would be allowable in some of our, our first mortgage uh, purchase programs. And uh, they, we do have a wealth of resources out there, again, not only uh, for Freddie Mac resources, but pointing in the directions of uh, some other thoughts around uh, closing costs and down payment assistance. Um, so the the other category, I shouldn't say category, the other thing that Freddie Mac has been involved in and uh, providing information on and has been active in many communities is um, the purchase market. Obviously, the market still uh, remain to be very fragile here. And uh, what we want to do, again, ensure that uh, there is broad-based knowledge and broad-based opportunity for first-time home buyers and other purchasers in the market, primarily in the form of information. And as I mentioned earlier, primarily in the form of linking opportunities that Freddie Mac is involved in, such as the HSA initiative, to ensure those that uh, are eligible borrowers uh, can pro provide the, the financing opportunities out there. And again, uh, while Freddie Mac does provide financing in those spaces, we are involved in other activities that support other types of permanent financing. So we continue to be active in that space. And the last slide here um, on permanent financing, or excuse me, purchase market financing, it just gives you a look at um, some of the available material out on our website. But again, uh, thank you for your time today, and I look forward to any questions um, or thoughts you may have. Um, and again, uh, I am Mike Dawson, and the I think my contact information is available in these slide back here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, and, and thank to all of our presenters. I'd like to just. Um, we emphasize one thing Mike said, and, and for those of you that um, don't have very close relationships with your state housing finance authorities or have not worked with them on single family financing, they are a source again for financing, especially more, obviously mortgage lending in this regard. And as Mike said, they were in effect shut down uh, when the bond market collapsed for a couple of years, but they now have a source of uh, financing from the GSEs, they have stepped up and started to uh, take more activity uh, under their wing in this area. And don't just think of them as multifamily rental housing uh, financers or low-income housing tax credit allocators. They are a source for you to talk about, especially where you're seeing issues of the lack of liquidity for certain neighborhoods or certain activities. Um, go have some conversations with them. They're a great resource uh, to talk about uh, this issue. And I want it, we're going to go into the question and answer session. Um, what I'd like to do is kick it off with one question uh, and then turn it over uh, to Kent to moderate the, everybody else's questions. But the question I have, and, and for lack of a more sophisticated way of saying it, appraisals are driving everybody nuts. So, LaDonna, Tom, Mike, what is going on from your standpoint? What do you see as issues with respect to appraisals? And, and let's start with LaDonna, just to put it in order, but I'd like to hear from each one of you. Well, if, if I'm going to put the appraisal issue, I think, into context with what we're talking about today, I think it's just around making sure that the appraisers that we work with understand layered financing themselves. Um, Chase has done some um, outreach and training through, you know, some of our uh, partners in terms of the real uh, the appraisers, excuse me, that we work with just around making sure they themselves even understand how to these contracts can get very detailed, very convoluted. So when they go in and they come up to these affordable developments and things and they're seeing net purchase prices at X and they're seeing the market level at that and trying to get them to understand, okay, you can't go with the net purchase price if they actually are using this brand and it's going to be recorded as a lien, so now it's blowing the CLTV 
out of the water. So also, when appraisers are coming out, guys, and they're coming to the development, they're coming in for their appointment to do the inspection on the property, make sure when, you know, we're giving them a copy of the sales contract. As lenders, we can't, you know, loan officers cannot talk to appraisers. We are now regulated. We can't have those conversations. We can't talk to them. You can. When they're coming out, make sure you're clear, you know, here is our development. This is how it works. This is our NSP grant that we're using. This has to be recorded as a lien. This purchase price is really X, and then, you know, the net, they're using this as down payment. You've got to have that comfortable conversation, and that's why I said it really starts up front, working with the bank around how this is really going to look for your borrower when they come in and apply for a loan based on how this grant is structured so that, you actually have the knowledge and savvy when that appraiser comes out and inspects that property to say, yeah, no, this is a grant, this is how it works, this is a recordable lien, you know, so really the purchase price is X and that's at the market level and this is going to get us here. You need to be able to have that conversation very confidently. So hopefully that kind of answers your question, Rob. You started, let's see what Tom has to say. Well, first of all, I agree with LaDonna, and the only thing I would add is one of the things that, um, probably the, 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 the tough areas that are, that have been the most problematic, uh, from an appraisal standpoint, would be, uh, appraisers wrapping arms around, um, uh, subsidized, uh, sale prices, uh, and, and, and resale restrictions. You know, there's guidance out there now, at least on the conventional side, that, that, uh, states that, that appraisers are to, to comment and, and, and appraise one way when the resale restrictions terminate and another way when the resale restrictions survive foreclosure. Uh, that has been a, 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 a big problem for appraisers who often aren't aware that the restrictions even if you uh, purchase prices, uh, through NFT is that the appraisers are, are challenged to find something comparable in the market. So, and some of the subsidies are, have been huge. Uh, and just the other day we saw a, a sales price of 90000 on a, on, a, on a property that is in a market of $200,000 homes. And the appraiser really struggled with, uh, you know, coming up with, with comps to, to fit. So, uh, it, it, it's really been an education process for appraisers as well and how they, they need to look at these properties. Uh, I would always ask the appraiser to give me, uh, both a subsidized and non-subsidized uh, value of the property, so we could work with that. But but there's there's just a, a, a literally a degree of confusion as, as to how they they assess those properties. Mike, anything to add? No, the uh, I think Ladonna and Tom have stated it well. I mean, the, by charter, Freddie Mac cannot purchase um, any loan that has a greater than eighty percent loan to value without some form of credit enhancement, whether it be structured or mortgage insurance. So appraisals are obviously near and dear to all of our hearts here, and but we do recognize the challenges, particularly in rural markets, around appraisals. So uh, as we work um, closely with Tom and LaDonna and others to ensure we've got the right practices around policies and procedures around it, to take into account various markets and various challenges within there. We hope to work with them and others to uh, kind of fit those challenges into our purchase programs. So would it be would it be safe to say, Tom and LaDonna, that if an NSP grantee were to contact you as they were getting their program underway, you could help them with the uh, dialogue they would need to have with the appraiser to get the appraiser as educated as possible before the appraiser goes out and looks at the property. Would that, is that something that you help your partners with? Yes, and we, we also uh, try to instruct our originators to, to, to get very much involved in that up front so that the, the required information is given to the appraiser right when the order is placed so there's so there's no delays and and, and the request to to reassess the property once uh, additional information is, is known. Correct. Right. So that's what Tom just said, Rob. Great, great. Ken, can I turn this back to you to, to moderate Q&A? Surely. And so we've got a number of questions lined up. So Brian uh, Watkins has been standing by very patiently. He's got a couple questions, uh, one about uh, 
combined loan to value and another about mortgage insurance. Where are you calling from, Brian? Thank you guys so much. I'm calling from Detroit, Michigan, City of Detroit Planning and Development Department. And uh, got a lot of valuable information, and the City of Detroit is indeed involved with NSP 1, 2, and 3, um, yeah, or as, as it stands, 3 in, in, in the works. But <clears throat> the, the biggest question I'd like to ask is, um, uh, I did kind of put up two or three questions, but the biggest one is, was underpaid in my uh, number one, is it a thing of the past, right. and are there any programs for underpaid in my that coexist with NFP funded notes? Uh, and to piggyback on that, um, <clears throat> I guess the, the LTVs that are being uh, associated that are appropriate with respect to uh, the coupling of these funds, uh, as well as the SHA, the, the 105%, is that 105% beyond the FHA max? Or is this, is that, or what does that 105 percent represent? So basically those are two separate questions, if I can phrase them in that way. Uh, this is Tom. Uh, the question again on the 105 percent, could you repeat that? Yeah, with respect to 105 percent LTV, um, can the 105 percent CLTV go beyond the FHA max? In this case, the, the maximum of the FHA finance denied in the state of Michigan. Uh, you know, the 105% that I referenced in, in my presentation was the ceiling on a, on a conventional loan. FHA words their requirement a little differently. Basically, the, you, the sum total of your liens cannot exceed the acquisition cost of the property. But where there is rehab work through a government agency uh, that, is, that is part of those liens, the um, uh, the amount or cost, uh, the, the total amount of those liens or profile acquisition costs um, uh, can exceed the appraised value, and there is no cap. You know, we've done a fair amount of work with different housing agencies where, where technically we had a CLTV of 150, 160 percent, and it really was a, a situation where the the amount of we have work. Uh, wasn't realized in the, the value of the property, uh, at least initially. Uh, so FHA is a little different. There can be no cash back to the borrower, but so long as rehab is involved, some of the liens, uh, and, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, some of the liens can exceed 100% of the acquisition cost, but, but, but it can definitely exceed the, the value of the property. Thank you. Could you repeat the, the first part of your question? Because I, I'm, this is Rob, and I'm not sure I exactly understood what you were asking about the first part. I, I thought you said PMI, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, uh, the, the question was about lender paid MI, or MIP, um, which was appropriate some years ago, 2005, 2006, on conventional notes. Um, is lender paid mortgage insurance a thing of the past? And if it's not, are there any lender paid in my programs that coexist with these newly, you know, um, with, with NSP funded notes? Yeah, and from, from Bank of America's perspective, I'm not real close to that, but I believe we have discontinued our lender paid in my program. And currently at Chase, we have no lender paid in my options on those products that are eligible where we can structure the community seconds on them, which are those affordable products. We don't have lender pay in my options on those currently. Could could you guys um, briefly talk about your view of what's happening in the private mortgage insurance world? And you know, Rob, before anybody addresses that, I'm sorry, Kent, I feel that people have asked me questions, but for some reason my chat feature for me to respond isn't turned on. So if there is someone who has a specific question, Chase question, if you want to email me after the presentation, that's fine. I didn't want people to think I was ignoring them. Okay, so I'm sorry, Rob. Now go ahead and repeat your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you'll answer mine. Um, the, from a PMI perspective, private mortgage insurance, the, the environment, how do you all see it right now playing out? I mean, specifically for the, the distressed markets that a number of our NSP grantees are working in. Do you see um, what what's the environment from your viewpoint? Well, I was going to say from Chase's viewpoint, and, and I, I would think Tom might see it the same, we have less declining markets than we had before. 
So I see that as getting better. Um, I think they're starting to look at different programs differently, specifically on those affordable products that are tied to our housing finance agency bond loans. So I, I think it's coming slowly, but, you know, it's definitely not, I think, the knee jerk all the way to the right pendulum swing we had in the beginning. It's starting to swing back toward the middle, not probably as quickly as I think probably all of us on the phone would be like, woo, but, you know, it is not as drastic as it was um, initially. Tom, do you, do you see that as well? Yeah. I, I agree with that. You know, obviously the, the, the credit scoring is still problematic. Uh, they, they have overlays that are, are the most stringent. Um, but, they, but they are, again, looking at programs that have um, uh, you know, less cash into it. Uh, we're seeing some uh, MI companies actually reaching out to house, state housing agencies and, and discussing, again, some, some programs with the, the state housing agencies to be used in conjunction with bond programs, which, which all had but stopped at, at a certain point in time. Mm-hmm. But we are seeing still a, a tremendous amount of conservatism uh, and, and heavy audits on the, on the very back end, you know, where there are, are issues with uh, delinquencies and, and defaults and, and, and every one of those cases are getting heavily scrutinized by the AMI companies. But, um, but on the front end, it, it seems to, as Levana said, uh, you know, it's not where it was, but it has come back some. I think, I think everyone's getting a little bit better at understanding the metrics and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the causes of default and, and, uh, we're, we're just all getting a little more scientific about it. And, and I think the MI companies have as well. And, so we're, we're seeing in some cases they, they are loosening uh, some of the sardonic over the knee-jerk reaction. Um, but, but it's still a long way to go. I mean, there's, there's, there's no two ways about it that it is, it is difficult to get high LTV conventional financing today. Tom, could you just, uh, for purposes of, of education, declining markets is a term of art in the industry. Could you just say what that is? Because there's actually, I know, uh, something that you and LaDonna see every day, which is a, a, a defined set of markets that are viewed as declining. What does that mean to you? Sure. Well, there, first of all, there's no market in the country that, that any lender can't lend in. Uh, a declining market would be a market where, where due to performance uh, within that market, uh, the, the, um, uh, just the delinquency history, the you know, the, the entire demographics of a particular market, property valuation, you know, what's happening with it. Um, there's there's a greater conservatism uh, in terms of the, the underwriting guidelines that have to be uh, applied. You know, the most typical will be a, a, a larger um, you know, cash investment on the part of the borrower, a, a, a lower loan to value, if you will. So where you might be able to lend... Uh, you know, 97% in one market, you may be limited to, to 95 in another market that, that is, is so to designated as a declining market just simply because of, of what the uh, property values in that market have, have done. Thanks. Um, Ken? Yeah, let's go to Nancy. Nancy Baker? Um, where are you calling from? Hi, I'm uh, calling from the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, and my question is for um, both LaDonna and Tom. I'm wondering how um, you're communicating your willingness to do these types of loans to your frontline loan-originating staff. I meet with many of them in Western Michigan, and and they, they're either, they don't seem quite aware of the product, perhaps it's just, you know, government program over. But I don't know, but how are you communicating to them that they can't indeed do these as loans? So I don't, I'll have to that first and then let LaDonna give a perspective from, from Chase, but uh, at Bank of America, we have uh, guidelines that are published to, to all of our sales and fulfillment locations, parking locations, that instruct them uh, as to uh, you know, how we view uh, community second programs, soft second programs, um, how they submit those programs for review. We, we maintain a database that, that is accessible by all Bank of America associates that shows the specific programs we've, we've, uh, approved for their use. Um, most of them are active in, in, in affordable housing 
markets uh, and, and with affordable housing products are very well at my team, very well aware of my team, and we, we work very closely with them. Uh, we've done training sessions, of course, with uh, you know, the bond programs. We were very active in, in training on Michigan and all the other state agency programs, but just in terms of use of affordable housing programs as soft second, uh, there is information out there if they, if they are willing and, and able to, to, to look into it. Unfortunately, you know, we, as such case, we've got a very, very large sales force, and, and even within the same office, you'll find one, uh, loan officer that's, that's totally aware of, of what the defender tips, and, and another loan officer that, that simply isn't. So it's a matter of, uh, just, reaching a little more deeply into, into what that, what's available to them. I really appreciate the two of you being on this call today because, boy, I'll be name-dropping like crazy. <laughs> and I was just going to say, this is what Donna from Chase, that is what you should do. If, in fact, you're going into an office and you're finding that they are unaware of a um, product or program that's available, uh, please give me a call. So similar to Tom at Bank of America, one, Myself, as the business development manager for Chase and the other peers that I had in my part of my presentation, it is our job to train both our sales and our operations staff on these programs and products that are available for use. Just like Bank of America, we actually have, as part of our online home lending guide, a specific affordable housing program, SharePoint Drive, which goes through the parameters of any of the bond programs we're currently working with, any of the down payment assistance programs that we're approved with working with, and it step-by-step step goes through and shows the loan officer. Here are the products that you can structure this program with. Here's the benefits that are available to the borrower. We attach the guidelines as something they can review and upload. So, you know, if you're going and you're finding that that is the feedback that you're getting, as Tom said, we've got thousands of loan officers please give us a call. Let me know, you know, who that loan officer was, and we can certainly reach out to both him and his lending manager and explain to them, you know, you're missing something here because we do this training. We've had this training. So please do that. I, I appreciate it, and thank you so very much. And I guess I'll be one of your adjunct training um, <laughs> later. So thank you so much for joining the call. Thanks, Matthew, for the question. Mm -hmm. And who's next? It looks like uh, Travis. Travis Brown, are you there? Hello, Travis. Maybe we'll come back to Travis. And uh, let's try Leonard. Leonard, are you there? Yes, I am. Very good. Where are you calling from and what's your question? And the uh, question is about the loan to value. Uh, we found that the um, that our members, when uh, they are going to sell, um, the liens that are placed on the property or the mortgages placed on the second mortgage or third mortgage is placed on these properties from the grant sources, from the NSP grant, from say home funds of the layered financing, the uh, lenders are counting the first mortgage and counting each of the second or third, which are mortgages just placed to secure the conditions of the grant sources for a period of years, which goes away after 30, like anything else, but, but, it, but the, uh, the amount that they have to repay goes down if they sell, and there are no payments, but all of them are added together, and all of them added together with the first make a loan to value that is sometimes 150% of the appraised value. Those are being rejected because of loan to value. Okay. Alan, that's a situation I was trying to refer to earlier. We, As a lender, we are required to include those secondary uh, liens in the loan to value calculation because they aren't grants. They are, are loans. And while they have a, a, a forgiveness provision or, or there's, there's no, you know, payment required, uh, should borrowers sell prior to the end of the affordability period or should they vacate the property and rent it out? There are a number of 
provisions in those those loans that that are considered events of default, and in which case they they owe the money, or at least a portion of it. And for that reason, we have to account for them in the loan value calculation. Where where we have some some latitude though, and and where I think some of the breakdown with particularly with NSP where there's rehab involved is how that acquisition cost is being uh, accounted for. So if your if your borrower is only paying a hundred thousand dollars, but the purchase price itself was subsidized, say by the amount of fifty thousand dollars for 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 rehab work. The acquisition cost can be determined on the basis of what they're paying plus the rehab. So you, your 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 loan does not have to be 150 percent. Now FHA again does have uh, uh, the additional enhancement that that you know if if the rehab work is done um, or if there's rehab involved, uh, the the acquisition cost can be um, you know the sum of what is what those those loans are for, for hard money. But I think what you're referring to is where you've got purchase prices being subsidized and, and the rehab cost is not being included in the acquisition. Correct. That's, that's well, an education question. For to purchase and rehab the property, then the, then the property is worth. So the, the grant money is what makes up that difference between what it actually takes to rehab, purchase yeah. and rehab the property uh, Again, it's not grant, though, and uh, that's what a lot of people confuse. It, it is a loan. Uh, it, it, it is not a grant, and so it does have to be accounted for. But I think where where the uh, where the education comes in uh, for lenders as well is is what agency guidelines are for how the acquisition cost and, and what the financing feeling can be. So the question, I guess, is how do you turn that mortgage instrument from something that looks to you more like a grant than a loan? What language should be changed? In no, no, you don't, you don't. You don't need to. You, you, if your that loan is made for rehab purposes, that loan can be included in the acquisition cost of, of, of the property. So, yeah. I, Tom, I think let, let, what Leonard takes is in, in the traditional where the NSP money is being used to subsidize the purchase price which then causes it to go above the uh, appraisal, no rehab. What would be a way to meet the public policy goal of the NSP grantee, which is to have some form of use restriction and meet your um, legal requirements not having liens in excess of? Sure, but, but that, and that's what I'm trying to say. There is, there is no limitation to the lender in that regard. We can... Uh, how so we can use that amount if there were $50,000 of NST uh, dispersed for rehab. We can use that rehab cost plus the, the actual purchase price paid by, by the borrower. So if the, if, if, if the NST provider is subsidizing the acquisition cost to the, the, uh, the nonprofit or, or developer to, to um, uh, cover rehab, that amount can be documented and included in the acquisition cost that, that, that's the basis for computing our loan. Right, on FHA, because it is FHA is the cost to acquire. You know what might help, Tom? Give, give them a financial example. So, I mean, you purchase a property for 50000 you have to put 100000 into it. Your your acquisition costs are kind of 150 Now the purchase price is 100 You're going to record a lien of another 50 that gets you back to 150 you're still at 100% because the cost to acquire, including that rehab, was 150 Did I kind of explain that right? But that, it was appraised at $80,000. And, and, but that's okay. HUD does right. not, the HUD does not uh, you know, require you to, to have a, a value that, that meets your, your, your actual cost. Uh, and, and unfortunately, with, with lenders, because I deal with this internally at Bank of America quite a bit, with even with our own underwriters, is that that's that's not outside their guidance. You can have a situation where, you know, again, just to put hard numbers to it, if if, if a purchase price is being subsidized by fifty thousand uh, dollars, so the borrower is paying a hundred, there's fifty thousand dollars of of rehab cost that went into it, but you're but your your valuation is, is not totally realized at at one fifty, it's say one twenty. 
you, you, you've got first and second loans of, of, you know, 150000 You can base your first mortgage against what they've paid for the property, but you can have a CLTV that, that exceeds 100 So long as that is a government entity provided rehab uh, purpose, rehab aim. Tom and Emily Donna, it's right. Go ahead, Leonard. It sounds like there might need to be some additional training, I guess, on our, our on the lenders here, because they're looking at the appraised value and uh, not allowing all of the mortgages to exceed that appraised value. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that's the case, and, and the, in the case of FHA, you know, the, the 4155, which is a, a, a guide for it. Uh, it's very clear in, in the secondary financing section that um, that that government agency seconds combined loan, if you will, to exceed the, the value of the property. Okay, so if, if there needs to be a little bit more education on parts of the some of the some of the underwriters, so I guess we are going to have to, as others have said, uh, lean on you guys for some TA. Please, uh, you know, again, I, I to review this this part of the HUD guide quite a bit. You know, it's section five. I'm mean, told it's section five. It's chapter one dash thirteen of the forty one fifty five, and I review it with frequency with uh, underwriters that that seem to to have a confusion as to to what would seem to be an excessive combined loan to value. Thank you so much. Appreciate the, the, the information. And, and just, we will definitely be in touch with you. Yeah, and this is Rob. And just to be crystal clear, I want to posit a fact pattern to make sure that this is clear. Nonprofit CDC, Community Obama Corporation, buys a house and rehabs it to the tune of $150,000 of acquisition and rehab cost. It then turns around and sells it to John and Mary Smith for a hundred thousand, but NSP money is left in to subsidize up to the hundred and fifty thousand cost. So now John and Mary Smith acquired with private financing for a hundred thousand, but have a secondary lien of NSP for fifty thousand, and it's only placed on a hundred thousand. So all the rehab was done by the nonprofit. It's all done, and now you're just making sure the nonprofit comes out whole. Does that work as well? Yeah, and, and so as you use your example, you, you can have a first mortgage in that event of, say, 96.5. You're going to do a max financing FHA loan on a $100,000 acquisition cost. You've got $50,000 of, of rehab NFT money that went into it. Whether your property value came in it at 100 or 120 or something short of 150 does not make it ineligible for an FHA loan. You know, you, you can still do that. For, you know, again, you're, you're not making a loan to value that exceeds what the borrower is paying. You can't give the borrower back money. They, 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 you, know, it, it, you still have to base your first mortgage on, on what's paid. But, but your combined loan to value can exceed your appraised value when you have that rehab. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, Ken, back to you. Very good. Let's go to Tim. Tim Kraft. Hello? Are you there, Tim? Perhaps not. Okay, we'll come back to Tim. And uh, next is Nancy, who's been patiently waiting with her hand up. Nancy, where are you coming from? Hi, this is Nancy Griffin. I'm uh, with a nonprofit housing partner in Florida. And my question is in regards to the uh, information that LaDonna said about uh, credit scores and the bank's overlay. Uh, she had mentioned during the slide that the bank's overlay was 660 to 680 while FHA was at 620. Is that correct? didn't understand. I'm so sorry. I was on mute. No, um, me... I wasn't saying the overlay on the conventional. That was just what the credit scores are on the conventional products when you're laying a community second. But, yes, on FHA, Chase does have a minimum FICO threshold of 620, which it would be an FHA overlay. Gotcha. Okay. 
I was just kind of confused on that. That's okay. The other oh, case that one just came out at 580. Uh, so, so there are, most lenders have some overlay above the, the absolute minimum of the FHA. Okay. Uh, let me follow up on that loan to value that y'all just mentioned. Um, how do we get around the combined loan to value requirements of the NST? I mean, I, I, I believe they have a combined loan to value of 105. Is that correct? But on the conventional product? Yeah, I'm talking about neighborhood stabilization program, actual federal guidelines like home and so forth that do have combined loan to value requirements of 105%, correct? So how can you give loans or, or, or sign up Mrs. Smith for more than 105% in, in outstanding mortgages, no matter what the things, LTV and how they figure it? Yeah, maybe maybe Rob can better address what the NSP requirements are. I, I I can address what what the secondary market requirements are, and, and that's what you reference is 105 is with the with the conventional limitation uh, for combining on the value. I'm I, I'm not as familiar with what NSP eligibility requirements would be. Well, since we have um, David and others on the phone from HUD, I'm wondering if if they would like to take a crack at that. If not, um, we can come back and try and answer that separately. But I don't, I'm going to see if they want to take a crack. Or if they can. I'm not quite sure about technology here. Yeah, or, or Hunter, or is that, uh, are you there? Perhaps they stepped away. And maybe it's just the participating grant, you know, grantee that's required by N5, but I pretty much thought that was required on all federal programs. Could be wrong? Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting blank looks from the people that are around me right now that are familiar with federal programs, so I think well, I mean, just the idea of selling a house to somebody that a house that's worth $100,000 and giving them a total debt of 150 that doesn't quite sound right. Well, well, as, as, as noted before, in, in Florida, I mean, they, they, the grantee yeah, basically eats the difference, and that, that money just doesn't go back into NSP. Right, and that, that actually, in a lot of markets where you know values, are, even if you if you acquire and rehab, the, the cost is going to exceed the value. You have to leave money in, right. and so that that's a recognition that goes on. What the gentleman was saying earlier about having 150000 in total and, and selling it for 100 and there being notes out there up to 150 and that will be allowable. Didn't understand. Well, again, most of that second lien, is, most of the second liens are, are going to be soft. They're not going to have routine provisions and they are forgiven over time and they will also be forgiven in most cases where that, that uh that original owner sells the property to uh, an income eligible borrower. So, so you're so talking the, about to, okay, to so the non profit of two hundred and fifty thousand. When they acquire it and rehab it, they can spend up to okay. Right. And what <laughs> well we can we can talk about this separately, okay. but I think to clarify, you can leave fifty thousand in NSP money in the house with a note that's a, that is to the borrower, but the borrower has no payments under that. It's, a, it's just to keep the restrictions in place. Okay, well, that's a note, but, you know, I mean, most people put a mortgage on it, and therefore your loan to value gets. Unless, I mean, it, I mean and the mortgage actually says that when they go to sell it, and they can't sell it for more than, I mean, they can't pay off this mortgage, and the retail restrictions do allow them to, to do so, I guess it's possible to write it that way. I, but what I mean, they aren't. That's not. That's not a, a lien that they would have to, to pay off if they they adhere to the, the resale restrictions. Okay. Uh, okay. I think we're we're combining the two. I think you're right. Uh, I just had somebody walk in um, to say you cannot indebt the borrower in excess right. of 100. percent 
So the structure right. would have to be yeah, hundred by the structure would have to be where that extra rehab amount is simply eaten by the nonprofit. Not eaten, but it's, it's, it's in the grantees' world to deal with. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we were unclear, and thank you for clarifying for us um, what clarity we needed. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, let's go to Larry. Uh, Larry, are you there? Hello, Larry? No? All right. Then, after Larry, we have Ken. And uh, hold on a second here. Go to uh, to Tim. Tim, hello, hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. Hi. Yes. Tim. Hello. Where, where are you calling from? Uh, Lafayette, Indiana. Very good. A lot of folks in the Midwest today. What's your question? Well, my question uh, it deals with the fact that uh, the speakers from the two large mortgage companies are talking about. Uh, I think there are rules and regulations that kind of apply universally around the country, but NSP is basically a local situation. And, uh, you know, do their representatives locally have the ability to make modifications to loan programs to fit local requirements and local needs as far as applying these uh, national requirements? In other words, do they give their local people flexibility to design a program that might meet what's going on in my community as far as being able to buy home, find home buyers for these properties? I, I guess I'm still not clear on, on, on the question. Um, can you go through that again? Well, yeah, you have, you have standards that you apply across the board, underwriting standards. Uh, but let's say I have situations locally here where those underwriting standards aren't going to necessarily apply. My borrowers may have credit scores of 590. Are you going to allow your people to be flexible enough to change credit score requirements so that I can get somebody in with a 590? No. So you're not going to provide flexibility, which is going to make NSP financing a little bit more difficult. But you're looking well, for again is an individual. You're an individual for a Go ahead. As, as I said, it, it, it's not it, it's not an opportunity to to fit every circumstance. And you, you are right. And it, it, we we use a a, a broad stroke uh, in, in in determining minimum credit scores or or overall risk uh, that that we apply uh, that that's going to be applied in in California like it would in Indiana. Um, we, we don't have an opportunity, at least within Bank of America, to, to make a loan today to a borrower that has a credit score of, of 590. It just seems, to me, me, that that is, seems to me that what we're doing is we're, again, restricting the people who can buy these homes and not serving the need of the folks who have to have the need served. For example, we have a part of our NSP area is heavily Hispanic, and the people who are going to buy in this area and are Hispanic are not going to have a lot of the secondary market underwriting criteria that Bank of America or Chase or Regency, whoever is going to require in order to make a mortgage. So are we going to be hamstrung in that we can't offer product to those people? And I was just hoping that there'd be some flexibility by Bank of America and Chase and so on where the local people could say, yes, we will design things a little bit differently, but that doesn't seem to be the case. What can I ask the question so specifically in your market? You just said the Hispanic borrower. What specific characteristics are you thinking are going to be a hurdle that's insurmountable? Well, I think one of the hurdles is going to be um, identity. You know, many of them have had to use false identity to get work, and now they have their own Social Security card. But when you go to pull a saw a credit report, you may get two or three different social security numbers on it. 
and that's going to be a red flag to the secondary market lender. They're going to say, no, no, we're not going to do that. There's some issue here that needs to be dealt with. I, I'll be right up front. You're, you're right. That's going to be an obstacle for us uh, right. and, and probably any secondary market lender. Um, you might need to, to find a, a local institution that, that's willing or interested in making that type of loan for their portfolio because you aren't going to have a secondary market home for that, that type of situation. I'm just curious what other NSP uh, grantees. I work for the city of Lafayette, and we have 11 homes that we've rehabbed, and we're doing another 50 or 60 of them. And I'm just curious what situations other NSP grantees have, have run into, if they've run into something similar to that, where the secondary market programs that are structured are not going to meet the needs of the people that we're all trying to serve in the communities where we're doing this work. And I'd just be curious to hear from other people at some point in time, you know, what their experiences have been. Do they find local lenders who are amenable to making exceptions to do maybe CRA lending or something like that, as opposed to the lenders who use the broad sweep of uh, national standards? Uh, this is Rob, uh, and I will answer from our experience of working with lots of different grantees and then depending on people's questions if they want to chime in. But where we find the most success in this is with funds that are set up locally um, to do just that. And they may be that a number of banks come together and provide um, low interest, a little bit longer term loans to create a fund that can then be used for first mortgage lending. I think so like a lending consortium or something. Right, and then the lender itself is only using, it's doing an investment in the fund, and it's not, they don't have to worry about secondary market, and the fund itself holds those loans. There are funds like that all over the country which are allowed to have much more flexibility. Now, performance in many of those over the last three or four years has been difficult, but I think we're coming out the other side and we're starting to see more successful um, back to, as with everything with the market the market went bad for everyone but uh, those funds are still operating they're being renewed in many cases so that's one option I think the other is as Tom said there are in many cases local banks who will portfolio those loans and as long as you can create a fence around the applicant that gives them comfort that there's a lot of due diligence being done in qualifying the borrower under whatever terms you agree to, portfolio loans can serve that purpose. But the, the traditional large national bank platform is a secondary market platform. So I would really encourage you to bring together some of your local um, community banks um, or credit unions to talk about this as well as see about some sort of consortium where the national banks who do want to help in this regard might be willing to lend into or invest into a consortium type fund. You know, is there an index of any consortiums like that that you're aware of? You, could, I, you know what I would start is with NHS of Chicago. It's got one of the largest ones I know of in the country. Um, uh, I think my contact information is on there. Get a hold of me. I can try and put you in touch with them as well as some others. Uh, and then you're, you know your, your community banks best of all in terms of bringing them together. But I'd be glad to work with you to identify some of those funds that have been created and are self-sustaining at this point. All right. Very good. Thank you. Ken, back to you. Thank you, Tim. And uh, let's see. Let's now go to Elise. no longer with us. So, how about, uh, let's go to Ken, and let me find Ken here, just a second. Uh, so, Ken, uh, let's see, his question is, the NSP example of reconstruction, in, in the NSP example, reconstruction costs of uh, 190000 market value of 215000 the sale price of 150,000, and we take a soft second of 65. Um, so uh, David Nagara is with us now, and uh, can you uh, sh uh, shed some final light on this, David? Hello, David. Okay. Uh, well, we'll get 
get back to the beat if he uh, reappears. So, um, and uh, Michelle, let's look at, uh, Michelle does not have a phone icon. So, uh, she just makes the point that uh, uh, the HRA of the City of St. Paul is developing their own financing products that they will hold long term. So, some of that uh, flexibility that Rob was mentioning. Uh, other questions? Um, looks like we're almost down to the bottom, but let's go to Patrick. Hello, Patrick. Uh, Yes, hello. Uh, this is uh, Patrick Dirk, and I'm actually calling from Asbury Park, New Jersey. Um, I, I want to revisit the uh, uh, CLTV issue that Leonard raised earlier and uh, ask if there's any difference in how that applies if you're doing new construction as opposed to rehab. Can, can those excess funds uh, beyond what the intended sale price is, would be that it subsidized the cost of construction does that work the same way in terms of that CLTV uh, that uh, you indicated worked for a rehab situation? Hi, Patrick. It's, it's Tom O'Neill. We spoke last week, I believe. Yes, Tom. Um, hi. How are you? And I appreciate the information that you emailed good. to me as well. Thank you. Not a problem. Actually, I wanted to, to chat with you about it. Your, your, your question is, is good for the entire audience. But the answer is yes. Uh, you know, I, I think in the situation that you've got, Patrick, it, it what's key is for, for you to document for your lender what those rehab costs are, because as clarified, my memory serves me, you're displaying a, a sale contract at, at just what the borrower is paying, not the rehab uh, funds that went into the property. So you're Correct. Right. Although, well, no, again, the point here is that, you know, uh, and, and it's where we perhaps run into a problem with FHA, it's not rehab, but construction costs. I'm using the term interchangeably. Yes, for new construction is the same thing. You you need to document the total acquisition cost, which would include the 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 funds that went into the home, and and what you're displaying to the lender is is a is a subsidized contract where where it's just their their acquisition, not it's not including the NSP money that that went into building the home, and so I. I think the key is to provide your lender uh, with that type of information. Uh, I was looking at a, a program today with the city of Chicago where their contract outlines all of it. It outlines the borrower's acquisition cost and it outlines the NFT money that went into it. And so a lender can, can use that to determine a total acquisition cost. Uh, they can still base their first mortgage off of what the borrower is paying but at least they can, can see the, 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 the total liens, and, and, and that is workable. Right, okay. Yeah, because that's exactly uh, the situation we've had in we right. Although you have to have the separate issue that you have to deal with with the uh, with, uh, DCA on, on retail restrictions. Correct. Yes, that's right. Okay, well, thank you for that information, Tom. No problem. Thank you. Patrick, and let's see, Travis uh, submitted a question. Uh, are the banks willing to be more flexible and aggressive to uh, lending or re-lending on the specific homes that NSP participants are buying directly from the banks via the first look programs? Um, LaDonna and Tom, do you want me to protect you on that answer and just say no? Hey. No, I, I, I was going to say no. I mean, I, obviously what we, we have to do is we have to ensure that the new mortgage we're making is marketable, that it, that it meets uh, secondary market requirements. So we, we don't have a lot of latitude by the fact that, that we happen to uh, have, have acquired that property through foreclosure. Uh, it's, it, you know, we, we have obviously a vested interest in, 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 in having it sold and, and a new successful homeowner, but we, we, we need to make sure that the, the, uh, the new buyer, uh, is also, uh, qualified under secondary market guidelines as well. And, and this, I want to stress to everybody what's very important when you start to think about uh, your credit needs is to really create the, the total exposure you're looking to, to put all of your lending partners, um, 
at, at risk of, and I know that makes it sound negative, but if you think in total you're going to do 50 houses and you'd like to be able to acquire 50 first mortgages for your home buyers, and the total cost of that is going to be X, whatever that amounts to, that's a discussion then you can bring your financial institutions, your more regional or even local financial institutions and credit unions together and say, how do we address this need? This is the amount of credit we need available. This is the portfolio we're talking about in terms of homes, and this is the criteria and, and profile of the potential borrowers. You'd be surprised how those sort of small lending consortiums get started with just that type of conversation. Um, also, with respect to what then Bank of America and Chase and Wells are already doing, they can then consider becoming a participatory lender within that pool. It comes from a different source. It's not from the mortgage group. It comes from usually the community development banking group. But uh, I know, for example, just in, um, in Chicago, Bank of America and Wells and Chase are all participating in the large $100 million dollar pool that's there. So it's a convert once you can put a fence around exactly what you need and who you're talking about serving and the condition of the houses you want to be sold, it becomes a much easier conversation with your lending partners. Uh, Surabi has her hand up. Do you have a question, Surabi? So uh, let's go to uh, back to Nancy Griffin. What's your question? Ah, uh, yes. Um, in what regards to the uh, banks being aggressive and so forth? My question is: I know Fannie Mae is not on this call, but they have a home pass mortgage where they're doing three percent down, no appraisal required, no mortgage insurance for our, their REO properties. Are you are you uh, Chase and, and Bank of America? Are you a lender in that program with Fannie Mae? I can answer I'm for sorry. Chase. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tom. I was just I, I missed part of the question. Could you repeat it? Are you a, a, a lender uh, through uh, Fannie Mae's Home Pass program, where they're giving special, um, you know, it's a special type program with three percent down, no appraisal, no mortgage insurance? I'm on their website reading it right now, so I'm just curious. So to answer that question for Chase. Um, Chase is going to be participating in Home Pass, but it will not be probably until like end of second quarter because we have to build out our origination systems to accommodate the product parameters. Okay. So that's that's, 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 that's not right. only their REOs. I, where we as an entity, um, we're trying to acquire REOs, you know, for this program, and we are running up. I'm running up against this as a uh, actual competition to to NFP. You know, when you when a buyer's out there looking and they don't have to, you know, get an appraisal and they just, you know, so it's kind of interesting. Is Bank of America going to get a participant? We are not currently a participant, and, and quite honestly, I don't know if it's even on our, our plate to consider. Okay, good. Thank you. Getting okay, for... Further questions? Kent, if we, if we don't have any, or do we have anything further? Uh, looking. And uh, at the moment, it seems we do not. Um, I'd like to present the opportunity again to David or, or anyone from HUD for some final comments uh, as they've been participating. It was frustrating. It's like, hello, hello. I couldn't say anything. Thank you. Um, I think one of the questions that came up a little bit earlier was about um, the about saddling homeowners with um, um, the subsidy amounts that the grantee may have put into the house. The, the way we have um, defined the maximum sales price for a home is that irregardless of what the investment may have been into the property, the maximum price that the 
uh, home could be sold for is the either the appraised value or that or that uh, total development cost. Now, within those parameters, you still have to uh, figure out what the home buyer can afford. So, to the extent that the property um, sales price has to be reduced in order to make it affordable for the home buyer, that is what we would call um, a development subsidy, or in other words, a sunk cost for the grantee. Now, if the grantee is, is, is trying to recapture um, some of those funds or they, or they want to they don't want to take on a development subsidy, then there are cases where um, they can offer a, uh, a second mortgage or uh, a silent second of, of, of some kind. But um, the, the, the typical case is usually the, uh, the development subsidy. So I think that question came up a little bit earlier, and I just wanted to, to add that piece. Other than that, I've just been sitting back enjoying the discussion. Uh, thanks, David. It's Rob. And yeah, we, we got ourselves um, tangled up for a minute on that, but then ultimately freed ourselves and and, uh, and I hopefully uh, answered that uh, consistent with what you just said. But okay. any other, I do, would like to know if you had any other thoughts or anyone from HUD or, or uh, are we good to go? I, I, th I think we're, we're good to go. Um, I, I would ask that, that as for, for those uh, grantees who are remaining on the call, to the extent that um, there are other issues around home mortgage financing that we did not discuss uh, this afternoon that perhaps we could discuss in further detail, uh, please let us know about that through the uh, survey that we have at the end because we could always do follow-up webinars. Um, we just want to make sure that we're providing value to you. So thank you all. And this, uh, when you when you do leave the webinar, you'll be taken automatically to a brief survey form. And we again uh, hope you take just a couple minutes to give us your feedback. That's uh, valuable to us. So, uh, Rob, any final thoughts for you? No. Okay. Uh, Other than, you know, thank everybody for joining, especially thank our panelists uh, for taking the time out of their day, uh, Mike and LaDonna and Tom. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, building on what uh, David said, any either future topics, um, pass along to HUD through the survey. Any specific questions, you can contact any of us um, through uh, the contact information you have in the, on the webinar. Great. Thank, Thank you for these, these uh, upcoming webinars, uh, HUD NSP webinars in March. A uh, whole roster for you, and uh, we look forward to uh, hosting some of these here. Mm -hmm. so thanks for being here, everyone. Thanks again to our panelists and our presenters and, uh, and our participants. That's the word I'm looking for. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon on another HUD NSP webinar. Take care, everyone.